Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Psalm 106, Psalm 106, and we're going to be looking at a, a benefit that prayer offers to us that nothing and no one else can, and uh, what a wonderful blessing it is to pray, and here in this prayer, we see recorded uh, some very uh, gut-level honesty, and uh, the psalmist uh, is just laying bare his soul and being honest about his nation, his people, uh, and and God, and making request of God, and um, and you know we have friends, we all have friends, but there's there's not too many people that we can be that honest with and that transparent with, and really just bear our soul open to. Uh, you know, some people would use it against us. Some people would think less of us. Uh, some people would uh, would hurt us with that information in one way or the other. Uh, we just can't, we can't often, unfortunately, uh, we don't feel that comfortable to be that honest. But with God, it, it, it's important to be honest because he knows everything anyway, right? right. Uh, you're, you're, you know, if you try to fluff up God, you're wasting your time because he knows what the truth is. He knows what your heart is, not more than what your words say. And uh, so in prayer, we can be so honest with the Lord, and, uh, and we can get real with God because he already knows the reality of everything anyway. And um, so we're looking at the, the prayer offers us an opportunity like nothing else does in Psalm 106. And the, I'm not going to read through the whole text. We're going to read some highlights. And I want to encourage you to read through it. It's 48 verses, a very lengthy portion of scripture. As the psalmist is, is talking about the condition of his people with the Lord. The first thing we see in the first three verses is the preparation of prayer. You know, I've mentioned many times when we go to prayer, we need to uh, adore the Lord. We need to give thanks and praise to the Lord before we ask him for whatever we're going to ask him for. Uh, we need to spend some time in praise. And here we see that example here in this psalm. The psalmist says in verse 1, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? None of us can exhaust them. Uh, but we do need to say something about some of them. Uh, who can show forth all his praise? Obviously, no one can. But we do need to praise him, even though we may not exhaust it. We may not cover every detail of the greatness of God. Uh, we do need to uh, be faithful to give him praise. And then verse 3, it says, Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. So we see the preparation of prayer. First of all, we see uh, praise to the Lord. Uh, he's praising the Lord for his goodness uh, in verse 1. He's praising the Lord for his mercy in verse 1 that, that endures forever. And, uh, and you know, as I mentioned before, even though we may not be able to uh, numerate every blessing of God or praise God for every detail about him, because we're just, we're finite and he's infinite. But you know, uh, there, we need to be able to articulate something about God in praise and something about God in thanksgiving. And that's the second point. Give thanksgiving to God, uh, to the Lord. And, and he mentions for his mighty acts that he has done in verse 2. And uh, for his blessing on obedience. Uh, and talking about those that keep judgment. Blessed are they that keep judgment. Aren't you glad God blesses us for obedience? Oh, Isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, he doesn't just say, well, you should have done that anyway. Uh, and, and we need to make sure that we're blessing our children for their obedience and just to, instead of just assuming that's the way they ought to be. Well, yes, that's the way they ought to be. Uh, but a pat on the back goes a long ways. Amen. We're going to make sure we correct them when they do wrong. We need to make sure we praise them when they do right. And God blesses us when we're obedient. And, and, and he gives thanks to him for his blessings on faithfulness. He that doeth uh, his commandments at all times. Obviously, none of us are perfect. None of us are always doing right all the time. But aren't you glad God blesses us when we're faithful to do right? 
and to be obedient to him and honor him with our lives. So we begin with praise and thanksgiving uh, to the Lord. But the very first point we see there is the transparency of openness before God that prayer offers to the child of God. And we see this in the first few verses, verses 10, 4 through 10. And he's talking to the Lord, remember, O Lord, with favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice with gladness of thy nation, that I may glory in thine inheritance. Uh, so he's, he's saying, Lord, uh, we, we want to be blessed by you again. The nation of Israel was in a time of judgment from God because of their rebellion against God, their idolatry against God, and their sin against God. And he's going he's gonna to discuss all that. He's very honest about the condition of the nation and, and the, their condition of their relationship with the Lord. But he's asking God, can, God, can you work to where we can see good again? Can you work to where we can see your blessing again like we had it before? And I don't know about you, uh, but I'm praying that for our nation. Uh, Lord, can you give us some grace? Uh, can you give us some leadership that will lead us in the right way uh, just a little bit longer? Uh, can we get back to where we're being blessed by you to where we can bless other nations? Uh, can, you, can you do that one more time? Uh, you know, uh, I know we've sinned as a nation. And he says in verse 6, we have sinned with our fa fathers. As a nation, we have sinned. We've killed millions of babies. Uh, you know, Terry saw a post on Facebook. Uh, this, this woman, is she's due already. Her baby hasn't come, but she's due already. And in her state, even on her due date, even though she's overdue, she can go get an abortion. Isn't that pathetic? I mean, the whole thing's pathetic, but that's real pathetic. And then you got the governor of Virginia, and he's still the governor, talking on radio about how he delivered a baby and has set it out there to die. That's pathetic. That's murder. That's just, there's no way around that not being murder. But he's still governor. He's still doing fine. And he hasn't had much repercussion from anybody on that. But see, we, we as a nation have sinned. And the, the writer here, the psalmist, acknowledges the sin of the nation, the wickedness of the people, and not only their forefathers, but he says, we now currently have sinned with our fathers. And, uh, and he's talking about the, the sin of the nation. And, you know, uh, his request in prayer, he's asking the Lord to bring favor to them again, to visit them with deliverance again. They'd been in bondage because of their sinfulness. And we'll look at that in a little bit. But he's asking God to bring gladness to the nation again. That the nation can rejoice. He's asking the Lord to, to help them benefit from God's glory uh, once again. That I may glory with thine inheritance once again. See, he's, he's asking the Lord to remember his favor on his people. To deliver his people once again. To show his people his goodness and to cause them to rejoice. And we see that in verses 4 and 5. Uh, and then we also, not only his request, but also his repentance. In verses 6 and 7, he's acknowledging the sin. He's acknowledging the national sin of the people of God in the nation of Israel. He's acknowledging the historical sin of the people of God. See, they didn't understand the greatness of God. Notice there in verse 7, our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They, they had forgotten. They, they didn't understand the greatness of God. They forgotten the miracles in Egypt that got them delivered out of Egypt. And, and even at the Red Sea, the miracle of deliverance. Uh, they forgot about the mercies of God, the multitude mercies. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies. And they, he talks about how they got to the Red Sea and they provoked God and they spoke evil against God and oh, evil against God's servant Moses. And they they were not submitting to the authority of God. They forgot what God already had done for them in delivering them out of Egypt. And now they were fussing at God and fussing at God's servant. <laughs> 
And they were not appreciating the goodness of God that they had already seen. And my friend, we can be that same way. They were rebellious against God. They were bitter towards God. They were accusing God of things that were just not even true about God. And, And far too often when things don't go our way, we can be the same way. We need to learn from the history of Israel so we don't repeat that history in our own lives. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to learn from this prayer so we can pray effectively for our nation as well. And then let her see, we see the recognition in prayer. Uh, he's recognizing what God had already done. The people had forgotten, but the psalmist is remembering. And he's recognizing uh, what God had done. And that was part of the sin of the nation, forgetting. And we're going to look at that in a little bit. Uh, But forgetfulness leads to a lack of appreciation, which leads to a lack of uh, an action of rebellion and it leads to idolatry and destruction. And that's what we see in this text, uh, an event in the history of Israel, talking about several different events in Israel's history that they, they, they rebelled against God and they suffered for it. My friend, anytime we rebel against God, we suffer for it. There's always a consequence for our rebellion against God. See, God had delivered his rebellious people because of his own name. It says that in verse 8, uh, save the, uh, he saved them for his namesake. Aren't you glad we have the Lord's name as his children? And, uh, and he's good to us because of his namesake. Sometimes we don't deserve his blessing, but he blesses us because we're his children. And he doesn't give up on us. Aren't you thankful for that? He doesn't just give up on us as his children. Even though we're in rebellion sometimes, he convicts and he chastens and he brings judgment. But it's all in an effort to get us to get right. And God delivers his complaining children to make known his glory. It talks about that in verse 8 as well, that he might make his mighty power to be known. You know, when we're in a situation, uh, we need to ask God to show forth his power and majesty that other people would would have to identify this is something God did. Like Audrey's mom. The, the, the doctors had to admit this is a miraculous thing. James Sauer. We prayed that the outcome would be so great uh, that the doctors would have to admit it's a special thing. And they, they are doing that. He's there, he is, they, they, they never expected him to be doing as well as he's doing. And we give praise to God for that. See, uh, he, he, he uh, showed forth his power for his unthankful people. Even, even though they're at the Red Sea, he delivered them out of Egypt. He brought them to the Red Sea. And now they're accusing God of bringing them out there to kill them. And he doesn't give up on them. He doesn't turn his back on them. He still parts the sea and lets them go across and then destroys their enemies right there in front of them. See, God delivered his sinful people from their enemies' uh, destruction for their good. See, God promised them to go into the promised land and he was making good on his promise. And he delivered them from their enemies uh, and and, uh, their enemies did not have success. And then the second thing I want you to see that prayer offers us a rehearsal of regret that rebellion brings and and he rehearses the regret of the people and the nation as a whole and how their history and how they had strayed from God and been judged by God and then got right with God and then they strayed from God and they were judged by God and they got right with God and we see uh, this history here that he is rehearsing with regret about his people and this is part of the sin of the people and you know I was thinking about this in our own nation uh, we've had times where we've had revivals and, uh, and good things happen and bars shut down and, and uh, things go well. And then, uh, you know, prosperity corrupts us and we get kind of lackadaisical and then we get into sin and wickedness as a nation. And, uh, and God brings some hard times. And, and you know, uh, we, we need to pray for our country uh, that we could be blessed of God in a great way once again. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's too late for America, but it's getting close. And we need to pray and we need to be instruments of, uh, in his hand for his glory. But the first thing we see here in this regret is forgetting the goodness of God too quickly. You know, that's easy. That, we can do that. You know, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying something big. God, you got to do this, you got to do this. And boom, he does that. 
and then not too long, uh, we're fussing with God about something else. And uh, we forget the goodness of God far too quickly. And he talks in verse 11 about how he buried the Egyptian army in the water. And they, they praised God and they, they believed his word and they were, they were trusting God. And, and then verse 13 says they soon forgot his works. And that's how it works with us. And we've got to be careful. We've got to learn from this prayer that we don't repeat this same behavior. See, they forgot the goodness of God's deliverance from their enemies too quickly. They forgot the goodness of God's promises unto them too quickly. And many of them, in fact, this whole generation died off and never experienced the promised land because they forgot the goodness of God and his promises too quickly. See, they forgot got the goodness of God's praise for his blessing on them. See, they're praising him when he does the, the Red Sea miracle, but then they're fussing with him not a few days later in the wilderness because he took them out there to kill them. You know, and that's what they always did. We need to be careful how dramatic statements we make about God, right? In the negative sense. Not the positive sense, but the negative sense. See, they, they come to the Red Sea. Oh, God brought us out here to kill us. And then he delivers them out of that. Then they go into the wilderness and they don't have water. Oh, God brought us out here to kill us. And, uh, and then he gives water out of a rock. And then they go a little bit further. Oh, God brought us out here to starve us to death. Because all, we, all we've got, we don't have any food. And he gives manna. Then they go a little bit further. Oh, I'm sick and tired of this manna. Uh, God's going to kill us with this manna. we got too much manna. We need some protein. We need some birds. We need some meat. And God gives them a little bit extra meat. And they get sick of that too. <laughs> you know, the, this, we can do the same thing. And we've got to learn from their mistake that we don't get be so foolish as they were. But notice also, not only forgetting the goodness of God, but failing to appreciate the provision of God. See, God gave them what they needed when they needed it. But they kept fussing because they didn't have what they didn't, what they, that what they wanted. They didn't want what they had. They wanted what they didn't have. You know what that's called? Discontent. You know, discontent leads God's people into idolatry. And idolatry leads God's people into destruction and bondage. And that's exactly what happened with the children of Israel. And we need to learn. We need to appreciate what God has given. We need to appreciate what God has done. We need to appreciate the goodness of God that has been shown. And we don't need to lust after what we don't have and what we want to have. See, God gives us what we need. See, and it says in verse 15, God sent leanness to their soul. Uh, they thought they didn't have much before. Uh, God says, well, we'll see. We'll let you get along with a little less. You know, sometimes if we're not happy with what we got, we may end up without that too, right? And uh, we need to learn to be content with the things that we have, just like the Bible says. See, they have failed to appreciate the works of God that he had already done for them. They failed to appreciate the word of God that he had already fulfilled for them. They failed to appreciate the will of God that he was doing in their lives. See, he promised to take them to the promised land. But their discontent and their rebellion and their idolatry caused an entire generation of the people of God never to make it to the promised land. They, they lost that benefit, that blessing. See, they were not content with what God was providing for them. They wanted something more than what God had given them. And they ended up with less than they had in the beginning. You know, that happens far too often in, in, in Christians' lives and marriages. We get discontent with what we have. And uh, we want something we don't have. And then we, don't end, we end up with nothing at all. And, uh, and we need to realize we need to thank God and be appreciative for what he's given us. And then uh, not only forgetting and failing, but forsaking the plan of God. Forsaking the f plan of God. See, this is, this is a downward spiral. Starts with forgetting and then failing to appreciate, taking things for granted. And then, then just getting away from what God says, thus saith the Lord. And the children of Israel did this. They started speaking against God's leadership. They were forsaking God's plan. God chose Moses to lead his people to the promised land. And they were, they were forsaking God's plan and, and speaking against and working against God's leader. 
They were forsaking God's promised land that he promised them and rebelling against his leader who was given the job to take them there. And that the life that, that they, 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 they were forsaking living life God's way and it ended up destroying them in their rebellion. And then, you know, when, when things get this bad, forsaking God's plan, you know what's next? Favoring a replacement of God. Idolatry. You know, when we get discontent with God, we often replace God with something lesser. And that's exactly what they did. See, they did, God told them when they went to the promised land to destroy the Moabites. They didn't do that. And the Moabites were a problem to the children of Israel ever, ever, all the whole time after that. They influenced them with their idolatry and they intermarried with them. And, it, and they, it, they, they ended up going into bondage because of it. See, see, they replaced God with a calf. Remember when they were in the wilderness and Moses was up on the mountain? And, and they said, oh, we don't know about this Moses guy. They're, they're rebelling against God's leader. And then they say, hey, Aaron, make us something to worship. We don't, you know, uh, th- God obviously is, you know, we can't depend on him. So make us something we can worship. And they made a calf and they said, this is what brought us out of Egypt. And, and uh, you know, they replaced God with a calf. You know, I, I, last time I checked, the Bible says we're made in the image of God. I don't want to be like a calf. That's right. I don't want to look like a cow. I don't want to be after the image of a cow. I'd rather be after God's image, amen? The real true God, amen? See, they made themselves molded images to replace the true God. That something lesser. They altered their likeness of who they were made after. They changed the glory of God to something lesser. They're making themselves something lesser. They changed the glory they had with God to something less. And they changed the glory they enjoyed from God to something far less. And you know, when things get this bad, you know what? If you don't get right, it just gets worse. And they progressed further from God in deeper rebellion. And in fact, they, they, these gods they were worshiping, it calls them Baal Peor. Peor is a place. Baal is the god of the Am- 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 Moabites. And the, they worship this God with uh, prostitution and all kinds of immorality. But one of, the, one of the other things they worship this God with was sacrificing their own children. See, when we get away from God and we get away from God's word and we start believing a lie, there is no end to how wicked we can become. And here we see the children of God turning away from God into wickedness. And then number three, we see prayer offers us an acknowledgement of forfeiting God's blessing. See, he, he acknowledges the blessing of God they forfeited through their rebellion, through their idolatry, through their discontent, through their uh, forgetting the goodness of God. See, they forfeited the blessing of God by forgetting the person and provision of God. See, in verse 21, it says they forgot God their Savior. They forgot the great things that he did in Egypt. They forgot the wondrous works that he did in the wilderness as they traveled. They forgot the the great mighty things that he did at the Red Sea for them. See, they forgot. They forgot the person of their deliverer. They forgot the power of their redeemer. They forgot the provision of their rescuer. And then they despised his promises and his proclamation. See, when you forget God, you despise his word and you believe a lie. Satan always has a lie ready for you. When you turn away from God's word, Satan always has a lie ready for you to believe. And he, he, they despise the promises of God in verse 23 and 24. And therefore, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him them in a breach and turned away his wrath. You know, Moses was faithful as a leader. It, they, they weren't nice to him. They weren't kind to him. They weren't respectful to him. But he, he was faithful. See, they despised the pleasant land. They despised the, the promised land. Oh, we're not going to make it there. God brought us out here to kill us. See, they despised the grace that they had been shown to them by God. They despised the goodness that they had already experienced with God. And they despised the glory of God that comes only by faith. And then 
They also forfeited the blessing of God by experiencing his punishment instead of his blessing, his persecution. Talks about how they murmured against God's servant in the wilderness and and how uh, the, the ground swallowed them up and how they were sent into bondage in the, in the surrounding nations and they were scattered around. See, when we don't respond, when we turn away from the Lord and turn away from his word and despise his word and we continue in sin and we don't repent, we end up in punishment. And that's exactly what happened with the nation of Israel and I fear that's what's going to happen to our nation if we don't have revival take place. We've despised God, we've despised his word, we've sinned against God, we haven't repented And one day, God's going to judge America. And we need to pray for revival in our land. Then I want you to see also, prayer offers us an acknowledgement of the anger of the Lord that sin brings. And, And he's honest about this. He's honest about the wickedness of the people. And one thing I want to bring out, verse 30 talks about Phineas. This is not Eli's son. This is actually the grandson of Aaron the priest. This is a good man. This is a man that helped deliver Israel from the judgment of God. Because he, he actually killed somebody that was leading them astray. He stood up against what was wicked. And you know, I'm not saying we need to kill anybody, but I do think we need to stand up against what's wicked. Amen. We need to be willing to stand up against what's wicked in our country and speak up against what is wrong. Uh, No matter who disagrees with us, we need to speak truth, the truth of God's word. See, our, our idolatry provokes God to anger, to correct us. You know, when God disciplines his children, it's out of his love. Aren't you thankful for that? We'll never experience God's wrath apart from God's love. And here the children of Israel were in idolatry. And God was, was pouring out his, his anger on them to correct them so they would repent. But they refused to. And it ended up destroying them. See, God's people united with false gods and worshipped them. God sent plagues to his children because of their idolatry, because of their rebellion against him, their blasphemy against them, their immorality against him. He sent these plagues and they still didn't repent. And God's servant helped them repent. That's where Phineas comes in, helping them by destroying the evil among them. And it brought, it brought God's blessing again. And I believe that can happen in America. God can bless America again if we would just repent. See, our our rebellion, not only our idolatry, but our rebellion provokes God to anger. See, he corrects us, but he also chastens us. When we don't respond to his correction, he chastens us. And we see that here in this portion of the passage in 32 through 38. talks about how they provoked his spirit. And he brought the nations in to bring judgment to them. They were, they were taken into slavery. Talks about how they, they killed their own children in idolatrous worship. See, our sin can lead to the sins of others. Notice there, it says, They angered him also at the waters of strife in verse 32. So it went ill with Moses for their sake talking about how Moses lost control and he, he, he struck the rock again the second time instead of speaking to it because they were, he was so frustrated with them. See, their sin influenced Moses to sin. Now, Moses was responsible for his own sin and so are we. But we've got to understand our sin influences sin in other people. And the people's sin influenced Moses to be frustrated See, their sin was so frustrating to Moses that he lost control. Now that's his fault, but they're responsible for their sin. See, his lack of self-control due to the aggravation of their own disobedience. But we're all accountable to God for our own sin, but we're also accountable to God for our influence of sin on others. And that's something we've got to be very careful of. It's one thing for us to go into sin, but when we drag somebody else with us, That's a higher accountability. 
See, our, our unrepented sin always leads to further sin and destruction. And we see that in verses 34 through 36. When we don't get right early, it gets worse. See, they did not obey God's command to remove the source of sin, talking about the Moabites. They were supposed to destroy them. And then they became influenced by the Moabites. And they, they were influenced into their idolatry. And then guess what? They came under the control of the Moabites. See, when we give ourselves to sin, we allow ourselves to come under the bondage of sin. And that's called addiction. But we do it to ourselves. And you know, when the, the sin we become controlled by often destroys not only us, but our loved ones. You know, if you had asked those children of Israel, hey, you know, are you willing to sacrifice your children to idols like two years before they did that? They would say, no way. How did they get to the place where they were doing that? They were deceived. They were deceived by their own sinful choices to where they did something they would have never thought they would have done. You know, I was, I was doing some research yesterday on another sermon and I came across an article um, uh, it's Gilbert interrogating Gehring in the Nuremberg trials after World War II. And Gilbert asked Gehring, uh, Hermann Gehring, who is like Hitler's right hand man, how in the world did you get the German people to buy into this ridiculous idea of the small country of Germany taking over the world? Of course they were going to lose many lives, and they did. How in the world did you get them to buy into this? And he said, that's easy. It'll work in any country, whether it's a dictator, a monarchy, a parliamentary, or even democracy. It'll work in any country. All you have to do is convince them of some great fear. And when they are so fearful of whatever that thing is you said is so bad... You can lead them anywhere you want them to go. And that's exactly what happened to the German people. They created this fear. And they believed a lie. You know, we've got to be careful that in our current situation, we do not let fear overcome our faith. Amen? And we, we believe the truth of God over the fear mongers of the media and the liberal leftist and all that's going on in our world today. See, I want you to see our sinfulness, our sinfulness provokes God to punish us in his love. See, when God, first notice the correction, that's God's first step. And then the chastening, but then he also punishes. See, sometimes we just push God further and further because of our rebellion. See, we defile ourselves with our own sin provoking God. We stir up the wrath of God in our adultery uh, and spiritual adultery and idolatry and we choose our sin over God and put ourselves into the bondage of our own enemies and that's exactly what happened to the children of Israel then the last thing I want you to see in this I love this about the psalmist here he starts off with praise to God in the beginning of the text and he ends with praise of God at the end of the text and he's really gut level honest with God about the wickedness of his people in the middle of the text. But see, here we see him in prayer acknowledging God's grace and prayer gives us an opportunity to do that and we should do that. We see that in verses 43 uh, through forty. Eight. First of all, in verse 43, it says, Many times did, we, did he deliver them. God delivered them over and over. And they got right for a while, and then they sinned again. And they provoked him with their counsel and, brought low, and were brought low for their iniquity. See, he chastened them. And he chastens us. But you know why he chastens us? To get us to repentance. You know, and even 1 Corinthians 11 says this. And we go over it when we go do the Lord's table. But if it says, if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged with the world. You know why God convicts us of sin? To repent. And if we repent, then everything's better. But if we don't repent, you know what he does next? Chastens us. Why does he chasten us? To repent. <laughs> and when we repent, 
then everything's better. But when we continue in sin and we don't respond to the chastening, just like we didn't respond to the conviction, you know what happens? He starts punishing us. It gets worse. See, God was chasing them to so they would come to repentance. And then God is gracious and merciful to forgive when we do repent. God doesn't re forgive excuses. He forgives repented sin. We see that in verses 43, 44 through 47. God is gracious and merciful. He talks about the grace of God to forgive us if we will repent. Aren't you glad God is faithful, aren't you? Aren't you glad of that? He remembered his covenant. They repented and experienced his mercies. And then the last thing is, God is worthy of our praise and faithfulness for his forgiveness. You know, one of the benefits of God's forgiveness and grace should be our love to him. We should love him because he forgives us. He showed grace and mercy to us. So we should love him. And even as his children, when we get away from him and we get right with him, that mercy and grace shown to us to let us get right with him, to be blessed of him again, ought to cause us to be faithful to him and to give him the praise we deserve. My friend, this is a great text of scripture. I encourage you to read, read through it sometime this week. And think about this, this acknowledgement that the psalmist makes in a, in a deep level honesty with God about the sin of his nation and the sin, his own sin as part of that nation. But also praising God for his goodness and grace and, the, and asking God to visit his goodness and grace on the people again. If they would repent, he would. And if we repent, he will. Aren't you thankful for that? I hope, I hope America will experience great blessings from God in the future. We must, we must repent of our wickedness as a nation. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful text of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for the honesty that we see with the psalmist about himself and the people of Israel. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, even though we're not always faithful. Sometimes your faithfulness is experienced in your chastening of us because you love us. Lord, help us to repent sooner, not later. Help us, Lord, to experience your blessing, not your punishment. Lord, help us to experience your mercy and grace by getting right with you instead of your chastening to get us right with you. Lord, help us to be thankful, not rebellious. Help us to be faithful and not idolatrous. Lord, help us to let your word guide us in your will for our lives so we can enjoy your blessings till you take us home to heaven. We pray for our, the, our nation and the sin of our nation that we would see revival take place in our lifetime like this nation has seen in the past. We pray to that end in Jesus' name. Amen.